Hey guys, this is a lecture for political theory at Ohlone College. Um, <coughs> as you can tell, I'm still sick. I've been sick, man, for over a week. It was really killing me. So it's Friday. I slept like half the day yesterday. Um, but here we go. You can tell I didn't really make myself pretty for the... Uh, the video today, I just thought it's time to get another video out there. So here we go. Um, so this is picking up from our lecture on Monday in class. Uh, make sure you pay attention to Aristotle's analysis of why he thinks uh, groups, subgroups are incomplete and why the state, the city state is the complete group. Um, if that's still giving you some trouble, you can go look at my uh, other online lecture. It's a long one. We only need the first 20 minutes or so in this case. Um, so, yeah, so we're social animals, according to Aristotle, okay? Born in society, you're born to a family. No one picks their family. Very few people even pick their country, right? So that's kind of Aristotle's logic. Um, and society is composed of lots of different groups, all of which uh, all of which are important. Okay, so we have different economic groups, different families, different religious groups, different ethnic groups, right? And then one of Aristotle's main group distinctions, one he kind of returns to over and over again, is kind of examples of how and why groups matter so much are the few and the many. The few are the rich and powerful, and the many are everybody else, me and you. Unless your parents are in the 1%, like, you're the many, okay? We all like to think we're special or different. We're not. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> and then from this um, analysis of social class, the few and the many, that's where Aristotle develops his typology of governments. And so his theory of governments and politics is really built from his theory of society. You know, man's a social animal or a political animal. <coughs> Jeez. Excuse me. And um, what a really good government does in Aristotle's mind is it needs to take into account the interests of everybody when making decisions, okay? So not one group isn't supposed to win all the time at the expense of some other group. The common good, as Aristotle calls it, is supposed to take into account the interests of all the different groups and kind of combine them together into a larger interest that everybody shares, okay? So if one group, you know, maybe you're like a younger brother in your family and your older brother always gets to pick the movie or uh, the restaurant or whatever and you start getting frustrated and you say I never get what I want that's an example of when collective decision making goes bad right so solution could be we rotate who picks movies we um, compromise on a movie that maybe isn't my preferred movie or your preferred movie but one that everyone can live with that's the sort of basic logic okay and any government that sort of does this is a good government Aristotle's typology of government looks like this. Let me make my face go away. There we go. Um, so what we have here are pure types of governments uh, based upon the one, the few, and the many. Now, I've added the one here uh, because, you know, Aristotle looked around and just saw that, well, you know, there's, there's kings and monarchs and, and this really matters. And so in many social orders, you know, one person who's like the most prestigious, that counts as a group. It's a group of one, but that counts. Okay. Um, and we have these three pure types of government here on the left. Pure monarchy, rule by the one. Pure aristocracy, rule by the few. Pure democracy, rule by the many. These pure types when they make good decisions, Aristotle thinks, well, they're just fine, so long as they are making decisions in everybody's interest. Uh, but the problem Aristotle sees, okay, the problem he sees, I'll come back just for a minute. The problem he sees is that um, here, uh, it's hard to see, here, despotism, right? You have a good king, he's great, everything's wonderful, 
that he has a kid, the kid's just a self-interested jerk, and no longer is the kid making decisions that's in everybody's interest, but he's just making decisions out of his own interest. Well, that's no good, right? So that would be a corrupt type of government that Aristotle calls despotism or sometimes tyranny. And you have the same problem with uh, an aristocratic form of government. So long as they're making good decisions that, uh, you know, puts everybody in the, puts everybody, uh, takes everybody's interest into account, that's fine. But they stop doing it and you get a problem. And then same with the democratic forms of government, okay? And it's even worse than that. What Aristotle calls the cycle or circle of revolutions, he shows that, when monarchies degenerate to despotisms, they're then frequently overthrown by the few, which then become aristocracies, and then the aristocracy degenerates into an oligarchy. It's overthrown by the many, which is the democracy. Democracy degenerates into mob rule, and you go back to the beginning of the system, everybody goes, oh, look at all these awful you know, people, they don't know what they're doing. We need a leader to take care of us, and then that's back to monarchy. So we could call that the cycle of revolutions. And what Aristotle sees to try to prevent this degeneration of good governments into bad and then this cycling of different types of revolutions is, over here, what he calls the mixed government. Where did my... There it is. What he calls the mixed government. And the mixed government takes into account the one, the few, and the many, okay? And all different social groups are given a chance to participate in collective decision making, thereby having a voice in what happens. And the logic here is that both you get better decisions that get made, and you're much less likely to have these sort of violent upheavals of revolutions because the different branches will will check and balance each other, okay? So, and that is, it is, this is where the American founding fathers get the notion of checks and balances. It's pretty much straight from Aristotle. Okay. Um, oops, let's unhide me. So here I'm back. Um, and let's look at uh, some examples. So in Rome, the tribunate was, there's actually a couple of them. So it was like, there's a couple of sort of executive officers. Um, they were elected. Um, but, uh, anyways, you had something that looked like the one, okay? The Senate in Rome was exclusively for the aristocrats, so to sit in it, to vote in it, you had to be one of the few. But then, the many, there were these tribes, which were these tribal, um, uh, groups, and they each kind of had different geographical areas, and they had history that the sort of being from there and like that kind of thing. And if you became a Roman citizen, you were actually assigned to a tribe. And that was a mechanism of popular participation where everyone could go participate. Okay. It might be something today, almost like a, a labor union or something like that, where, you know, it's at your work site, you know, anyone can go do it, etc. Um, in Britain, around 1700, so, you know, not all countries in the world are going to follow this model, but this is one of the most prevalent models uh, in history. Britain, 1700, king, one, House of Lords, few, House of Commons, many, and then, big surprise, the United States Constitution. We took this straight from the British and a little bit the French and the Greeks, Aristotle, right? President the one, where'd my cursor go again? There you go. President the one, Senate Supreme Court the few, and the House of Representatives the many. Okay. Now, to extend this analysis, uh, we can look at, you know, Aristotle goes even further then. He says, look, all these different social groups actually really have um, sort of particular virtues that are that they contribute to the common good. So just like we talked about this general category called civic virtue, which are the qualities of a good citizen, different social groups each kind of have their own particular versions of civic virtue and the things that they do really well that they bring to the, to the um, common good. And then they also have particular dangers, which are vices, 
dangers that they uh, that that need to be avoided as well. Where did it go again? Okay, so kings are independent but egocentric. What does that mean? Well, it means the executive can, at various points, align himself with either the few or the many, depending on circumstance, depending on who's right that day, right? So the king being independent, he can kind of see, have his own point of view, or president, he can see, have his own point of view, and then align with different groups when necessary. The few have leadership, military valor, political vision. So, you know, kind of leadership qualities, right? Think Elon Musk, think Jeff Bezos, think Silicon Valley, these people who, you know, see far, have a big project or plan, and kind of an idea of how to achieve it. The problem is they think too much of themselves. They're basically ball hogs, right? It's like Kobe Bryant. Who's going to take the shot? Give the ball to Kobe. <laughs> if you look at the Silicon Valley people, they actually do behave that way sometimes, okay? And then uh, lastly, the many, which in Machiavelli's view are def definitely the most important social group. They're powerful. They're the best choice. They make the best choice of leaders, best choice of poetry and music, okay? Problem with the many is that they do wacky stuff, okay? So let's hide me again. And then notice here, you know, the few provide leadership and vision, but the many pick which leaders are best. The many bring the power that keeps the republic vital. And you see this in Machiavelli a lot, okay? So, um, so let's take a look at a couple quick variations on this theme. Any republic is a free or popular government that allows everyone to participate in collective decision making, okay? But we can specify different kinds of republic by looking at which group has the most power, okay? So it's not like you have to have an even balance. You just, everyone has to have some say. So in a monarchical republic, uh, king has the most power. This is how France conceived of its republic, of its king uh, pre-absolutism. So there's this thing that happens called absolutism. That's another story. But France, sort of, there's a long line of French political theorists that, you know, looked at the king as the one, the nobles as the few, and everybody else as the many. Where did my thing go again? There it is. Then you have an aristocratic republic where the few have the most power. Venice is a classic example of this. Sparta is another example. And then lastly, a democratic republic where the many have the most power, and that's Athens, United States, other modern types of states, okay? As I said before, this idea of the one few and the many is where the American founding fathers got the idea of checks and balances. This is one reason why American politics can be, be so frustrating. Only very rarely do the Senate, House, Senate, and President get run by the same party. This is why Democrats are freaking out right now because the only real mechanism of power they have is the filibuster in the Senate to sort of hold back a, uh, a Republican agenda. Now, uh, one of the key themes here is Machiavelli's defense of the many, right? We want to stay focused on the many. The many are really important. And um, notice you know, how important having good citizens is to Machiavelli. And he says, um, this is from one of the chapters in our reading, I recommend a large population and this well armed. And Machiavelli does mean with weapons. This is where our founding fathers got the Second Amendment from. It's from this type of analysis, okay? They really believed in the citizen soldier that came out very strongly for the founding fathers, okay? And now, up to this point, this is like pretty straight from Aristotle. In my next lecture, probably give us till Monday, maybe I'll get something up, but um, we'll be looking at what Machiavelli is doing different from Aristotle. So they're, they share a lot of ideas, they're in this big sort of historical way of thinking, but um, you know, Machiavelli is doing some things differently. So we'll get to that, but um, as far as the basics and the generalities of how Machiavelli is thinking, um, very strongly uh, linked to Aristotle.